Hello, I'm Peter Stein and I'm senior programmer for Frameline. Welcome to our conversation called Making Art in Vulnerable Times and Communities. This is one of nearly a dozen talks and panels in this year's Frameline Festival. And today's conversation is inspired by the wonderful new documentary called Can You Bring It? Bill T. Jones and D-Man in the Waters, which I hope you all have a chance to or will soon have a chance to see and stream during the festival. You'll be meeting the creators in of the film in just a moment. Now, before I introduce our moderator, I want to first thank our national outreach program sponsors, Gilead, Bank of America, and TiVo. And also a big thank you to our national outreach program community partners, a wonderful group of nonprofits around the country. They are AIDS Alabama, Hudson Pride Center, My Brother's Keeper, Rain of Charlotte, the Ruth Ellis Center and Transcend Charlotte. Thanks to all of you. Now our conversation today is moderated by Laura Seidel. You may well recognize Laura's voice from her many years as a journalist and correspondent for National Public Radio, where she has covered arts, digital culture, and the impact of technology on society. Laura has contributed to This American Life, Planet Money, and The Washington Post, among many other distinctions. It is a pleasure to welcome Laura Seidel to Frameline. Take it away, Laura. Thank you, Peter. Um, I am so happy to be here with an incredibly distinguished group of people. Um, Rosalind LeBlanc, um, she is the producer and co-director of Can You Bring It? And... Um, she currently is a uh, associate professor at Loyola Marymount. She danced with B Bill T. Jones uh, from, I guess, uh, 1993 to 1999, and then with Barishnikov's White Oak Dance Project from 1999 to uh, 2002. Uh, Tom Hurwitz is the co-director and director of photography for Can You Bring It? And he has won more awards than I can even fit here, but among them two Emmy Awards for Best Documentary Specials for the PB show, PBS show Jerome Robbins and the series Franklin, uh, as well as Sundance Awards for Queen of Versailles and Love Free or Die. Um, he has done photography for numerous films, including Studio 54, Cradle of Champions, Joan Didion, the center will not hold. Uh, Rodessa Jones, we are happy to have. Uh, she is the co-artistic director of the acclaimed San Francisco performance company, Cultural Odyssey uh, and the Medea Project. She is an activist and actress, uh, and she uh, works with incarcerated women and helps create performances with them. Uh, and she, in August she received of 2019, she received a special recognition for her service to Black Theater, presented at the National Black Theater Festival Awards Gala. Uh, Jerame Nakia Lee was born in the Bahamas and raised in Miami, and he came to Charlotte, North Carolina, in college and noticed the uh, more cloaked nature of queer and people of color life. Uh, and so he founded the Charlotte Black Pride in response. He's written plays. Uh, music and musicals, and has been working on a film during COVID. Um, his work tries to take people who are in despair and give them a sense of hope. I could go on about all of these panelists, um, and I hope I gave you enough of your due, but uh, let's just start in here with the film. So, um, uh, Roz and Tom, either one of you can start to respond to this, but I'd love to talk about the origins of, of Can You Bring It, which is taking this, this work from the time of the AIDS pandemic and uh, paralleling it with work you're doing now, Roz, uh, teaching students how to do this work from the 90s or the late 80s. Like the basic was really the late 80s, not the 90s. So Yes, exactly. So... Uh, the conception for this film uh, came uh, kind of in a in an interesting way. Um, I was in a hotel room in in Minneapolis, restaging uh, the first part of the dance, D Man Part One, which is one quarter of the dance, on the students at the University of, of Minnesota, and I was one of the the 
things that I was encountering was just that the students had very little awareness of the AIDS crisis. They had heard of it, but they really didn't quite um, understand the complexity of it. Mm -hmm. Yet they were with a, a with a, a dance like D Man in the Waters. They were very connected to the um, the the sense of joy in the dance. And so, without understanding the nature of it's a historical context. The joy was kind of um, uh, ungrounded. Mm. And so I was really looking for a way to ground the piece in its historical context. And um, I was in touch with all of the original, most of the original members of the dance. And I just reached out to them and said, what do you remember? Um, and in response, I got a flood. This was an email thread, flood of memories and just, I mean, and it was very clear at that point, this is a story that hasn't been told and needs to be told. Mm. And it was uh, not long from that impetus that um, the idea came, one of the dancers, Greg Hubbard said, you know, it really needs to be a film because the, all of these stories that we're telling are embedded in the movement of the dance. And so, you need the juxtaposition. What, what better medium to create juxtaposition than film? Um, and then I reached out to Tom and said, hey, I have this idea. Uh, what do you think? <laughs> and Roz called me. Yes. Uh, we hadn't really seen each other for about 20 years. Uh, when <clears throat> at 20 years before, we had worked together on a, uh, filming another work by Bill T. Jones. And, and uh, Ross said, do you remember me? And I said, sure, how could I forget you? So um, we began to film and Ross kind of introduced this as a little film. She wanted to make a little film uh, that was gonna educate people about this, this dance, this ballet. And uh, so we began to film interviews. And when we were done filming the interviews with the original company and Bill, it became clear that to me, that this was almost the best, maybe probably was the best set of interviews I'd ever shot in my life. And as a, as a, a, a cinematographer and a filmmaker, uh, that's a long time. Uh, these, these were an amazing bunch of people as you will or have seen in the film. They have, they, their, their emotions are tremendously available and they, and they give them to us with articulateness and feeling, they're present, they're there. It was wonderful. And I could tell that the story was a big story. And it was more than the story of a, of a ballet. It was a story of what art can do to, for human beings, uh, the role that art plays in, in, in our lives, especially in the face of crisis and catastrophe. And, and so, uh, and I, of course, I, Bill is one of my heroes and has been for many years. So uh, I just, I said to Roz, I think we got a feature here. And Roz, <laughs> who had never produced a film before, just heroically and gamely just said, sure. And that's how it began. <laughs> and became, in the process of making this film, became one of the best producers I've ever worked with. Just uh, extraordinary. Well, that's um, a nice compliment. You, you've worked with a lot of people. So. I certainly have. Um, but but uh, nobody's, nobody's learned as fast as Ross. Well, only I, only the, proves that dancers can do anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the things, though, that makes the film interesting is that you're both interviewing them and then you made the decision to actually show Ross uh, trying to teach this dance and perform this work with a group of students at Loyola Marymount. And um, how did you end up deciding to, to do that, to show, you know, we're taking this work from the past, teaching it now and intercutting these, these two things? Well, we did two things. We kind of did it in stages. So we shot the interviews that gave us a sense of what our story was, but how are we going to tell it? And then, we we shot the dance itself with the original with the Bill T. Jones company, not the original dancers, but with a company that existed when we were filming it, and they were magnificent. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and we, Roz produced and we filmed for a week uh, at Purchase uh, College in their, in their performing arts situation where a lot of stuff is filmed. Um, and, and we did some very new things in terms of filming dance. And then we had that and we were very pleased with what we had. But when we tried to kind of think how we were gonna tell the story, it became clear to us that we needed a sense of, of how that fit into today's world. And, and, and uh, then partly uh, by, by coincidence and partly by Roz's production magic, um, <clears throat> the, the film was to be put on her students at Loyola Marymount uh, within the year. And so we began to document that uh, over the course of a year. I, I, you know what, I really want to go to a clip right now from the film that stood out to me as one of the most pivotal moments in the film. So if we can cue that up, um, I'd love to watch this moment where you have rehearsed the students. Um, they've kind of got the dance down. And um, Julie, if we can uh, bring that up now, I'd love that. Why? Why are we doing it? Why? What are, what, what, what are we desperate for? What are we... What is our AIDS right now? For me, it's just been recently in my life, a lot of people have been turning on me. And every time I come to rehearsal, I have a sense of community here, so I feel comfortable. So I'm like happy doing the piece. So every time I do it, I think about all those people who were my friends and then decided that they were just gonna switch on me and start being rude and just like change their perceptions of me and it makes me angry but then I look at everybody's face when I'm dancing and that kind of takes me out of it so that's what I'm using. Okay, but I'm gonna ask you to go bigger. Like us, 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 including them. What are we going through? What's happening? Do you understand what I'm saying? Like, what's happening right now that is gonna make this piece be more important than anything else you do? What is it? What is it? What's happening? Mm. Bring them in. You know, it's not Yes, it's about you, right? But it's got to be about them, too. It's got to be about us. Where are we? Who are we right now? Yeah. I want to say, like, it, like, just looking on social media and everything, like, I'm tired of people always assuming things about people. Nothing ends up happening because everyone disagrees about how to get it done. Everyone thinks getting rid of guns will, will solve the issue. People think having more guns will solve the issue. It's nobody can come together and compromise and try to figure out because everyone has their opinion of how the right thing to do to do the better thing. I don't even like talk to, about politics with any of my friends, honestly. And even on like just deciding what I want to do like after college, like I have no idea. And I don't know like what I'm going to love. I mean, you are all of the same generation. And what I hear is <sighs> stasis, I hear this inability to make a decision, inability to do anything, to move anything, to make any difference, to make any changes, um, right? So all of this is about this getting stuck. We're stuck, what you were talking about, right? Of like, just, you hear this, all this bicker, all this banter on Facebook and it means nothing. Yeah, it's just chatter, right? Empty noise, that's not doing anything. So can D-Man do it? Can D-Man be the place all that frustration that you guys feel of like, this is just fucking bullshit. Nobody's opinion matters here. Nobody's going to vote. Nobody's going to do anything. They're just going to like things and they're going to, you know, say their opinions and spout it off because it's easy. Can D-Man be the place for each one of you that you break through that, that you actually move? D-Man has to be the place that you as individuals move this motherfucker, that no one else is moving. Right? No one else is doing it. That's what I hear. Your generation isn't doing it. 
So the nine of you are gonna do it, and you're gonna do it each night on that stage. That's the place, yeah? That's what it needs. And the stakes have to be as high as they were for Bill T. Jones and Arthur Viles and Heidi Latsky. And they're not the same stakes, but they have to be as high In, it, you know, I I have to to um, ask you both that moment. Um, just starting with you, Roz, you got so emotional with these students. You really opened up to them in a certain kind of way, um, and I feel like uh, you were making the ultimate point there. And I wondered what you were thinking at that moment as you're talking to these young students, trying to get them to get it. You know. Well, that was. Um... When we shot that, that was in 2016, um, the weekend before the election, 2016. And um, the frustration was with their silence and, and the question, what, you know, what is, what is our age? What is our, what is our biggest threat right now? And, and that the, and you know, I mean, in the film, you see that one moment, but of course there's, I've, I was rehearsing with him all the time and asking those questions and, and, and prompting. And, um, and so to land at Facebook and, and all of these other places when there was such a clear and present danger <laughs> yeah. uh, at that moment uh, with the election just days away um that was the frustration and and i would say more appropriately or more accurately fear like i i just felt very scared um that uh our our young generation just was not i mean you know they're the ones right they're the ones out in the street it's it's like it's like uh you know social change needs youth it needs youthful energy and if the uh, youth are unsure of what <laughs> what the what our issues are, it was fear. Um, yeah, we also had immediate fear too because their dress. I mean, this was this was we were almost at dress rehearsal, and their rehearsal was not good. They were not present, uh, and Roz had to pull it out of them. Uh, and as as you see or you will see in the film uh she does it, it, it's amazing uh how much better they get and more present they get because it's all about presence uh, they had the they had the steps but they had to have to have their hearts in the right place and it was it was that moment we both knew it we, we actually had talked about it a little bit before uh, we started shooting this it was that moment that uh, it happened right then. And yeah, I, it's, a, it, it's a remarkable, it's a remarkable moment. I, I want to bring um, Rodessa and Jermaine in um, part. I was because uh, you both uh, do work with people who are in crisis now. Um, and what's kind of interesting about the film in a way is you're working with relatively privileged students, you know, at a, at a college. Um, and so it's a little, sometimes you, you had to push perhaps with them, you know, yeah. and, you can know. I, can I insert one, one yes. thing actually, which will dovetail probably to where you're going with Rodessa and Jermaine, um, I, uh, about the students and the, and the sense of privilege is that I now understand, um, it, that the the generation, their generation, privilege or not, is really one that has been raised in an environment of of reticence, where it it is frightening to show up. It is you know the the history of ma mass violence that is their norm, and then also the um, just the sense of surveillance that they live with every day. So that reticence is not a was not I. I understood later that that reticence was not a lack of care. It is a generational, it is what 
our young people are going through wow. living, you know, having, having been born into a, uh, an incredibly violent uh, society where it's, it's, it's part of the norm to go somewhere and perhaps be gunned down simply because <laughs> you showed up in the wrong place at the wrong time. You wow. know, how do you get a group like that to mobilize? How do you get a group like that to speak and take a chance and take a risk? So, so I just wanted to bring that in as we broaden our conversation out because I think it, it extends beyond LMU students and really starts to talk about where we are um, as a culture right now. Interesting. I, I mean, you know, I'm wondering to what degree actually, Rodessa, you do um, work with women in prison or previously incarcerated women. Um, and Jermaine, you're working with communities that have not been seen or heard. And I'm wondering your experience about getting them to open up and turn their crisis into art? Well, for me, working with incarcerated women, already you have a group of, a, 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 a cultural group that feels as though they've already failed every contest that was designed. As women, they're bad girls, uh, you know, they, they don't add up. And as uh, Zori Neale Hurston said, you know, this is a contest not of my design. And I have to remind women of that, that we as women, there's a lot of reasons, as I, I would say to them, a lot of shit has happened to us. And I have to start with my own story of being a mother at um, 16, you know, in a world um, where my mother was saying, this is, God's, this is God's gift. You've got to do this. You've got to take care of this child. And at the same time, coming in from the outside, talking about art and literature and music, and you have these women who are like, they, they'd say, oh, you had a baby? You had a baby? And all of a sudden there's a connection that happens. Mm -hmm. And I start to talk about my own life. And I remember the, the first time uh, I, I, got, I got like Roz, I got just so teary talking to them about how urgent it was that they step up and tell their stories so somebody needs to hear their story and they needed to be able to explain what happened to them. And I remember one young woman said, uh, first of all, she said, well, why are you crying for us? And that made me cry more. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, she said, um, are you, she said, you know, uh, why are you telling us your business? Which is back to these privileged students. And then you have these people in the underworld, so to speak, or like black folks, you know, why are you telling us your stuff? Why are you just putting your stuff out there? And I said, well, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an artist. And I said, I want to be able to take these stories and create a path out of here, back to your community, to your children. And this young woman said, you're an artist. You're not the police? And I said, no. And she said, an artist, what's that? And I've been attempting to explain that, you know, to, to make that real to this population of people. You know, what is an artist in, in jails and prisons, you know? And um, at the same time, the urgency of it in theater for the 21st century, for me, I'm not interested in art for art's sake. I'm interested in art that's gonna save a life because I've seen it do that. I've seen it give women voice, you know, women who've been kidnapped, women who've been raped, women who've been beat down in their own communities, women who are addicted to drugs. And I, and I have methodology to get them to stand up. And they, I said, you've got to say this out loud. You've got to say this out loud. You've got to say this hurts me. And well, I may start crying. I said, we all should be crying. And then we're going to stop crying. And then what are we going to do? And it's been an extraordinary journey you know, of uh, the realism of, uh, back to D-Man and, and watching my brother Bill go through watching uh, Damien pass away, this masterful artist. And, and uh, my brother trying to make sense of it and at the same time holding on to the beauty and the physicality and the memory of Damien saying, no, we can't let this go. We, uh, this, guy has, this guy has a right to be remembered. And, and we click there, you know, we just click there and that, yes. And back to these young students, I think that um, the, the privilege, I, I, we, we feed them as Roz was saying, they come into a world that's so violent, you know, yeah. and, and, and they get confused about what's real and what's not, you know? And then uh, just George Floyd this past, past year, George, us all seeing George Floyd die on camera and at the same time, our children said, oh, hell no. They knew the difference in that moment that this is not TV. 
This is not a movie. And they took to the streets, you know, I mean, and, and they brought us all. They were like, we got to do something, y'all. And as, as a, I'm a great grandmother, and I'm like, OK, I'm coming. I'm coming. Y'all go ahead. I'm, I'm coming up behind you. And at the same time, they were so that uh, everywhere I looked, people were so magnificent in their fury and their sadness. And at the same time, here we are holding hands and, and, and demanding change for the sake of all of us is what I feel like young people uh, have been saying at this point in, in the 21st century. Yeah, yeah, and I and and I'll just stop there so Jermaine can. Yeah, I want to let Jermaine because yeah. you know Jermaine, who is who is the the youngest artist here, um, has came into a place I guess where you felt that there was a whole community of people who were unseen. Um, yeah, yeah, that was one of the reasons why we established Charlotte uh, Black Pride in two thousand five, um, because there was just this gross invisibility of um, black queer people in Charlotte. You know, I, I come from Miami, Florida, um, which is what I would consider an affluent LGBTQ plus community um, where, you know, you, you, see, you see community at the grocery store and at the beach and at the park, you see couples, you see families. And um, I just didn't see any of that. Um, and wanted to make a difference. But before I go there, I just, I wanted to go back um, to the clip uh, of, the, of, the, of the piece because it just had, just hearing Roz ask the student, what is your AIDS? Which I think is such a profound mm -hmm. question um, to ask, particularly Generation Zs. Like, what is your AIDS? You know, because when, when you think about what AIDS was to the world, but particularly our country and the queer community in the 80s and most of the 90s, it was our pandemic, you know, mm -hmm. right? It wasn't affecting white women and it wasn't affecting white kids. And at one point it stopped affecting white men. So it became a black and Latino disease. Mm -hmm. So its importance in our country decreased when it no longer was affecting whiteness. But I remember, I remember family members dying. I remember neighbors dying. I remember my art teacher dying. I remember my dance teacher dying. I remember my theater teacher dying. Um, Wow. I have people I went to college with who are no longer with us. Um, I wrote a musical called A Walk in My Shoes. I had a wonderful opportunity. One of, one of the partners for your organization is a, a wonderful HIV agency here in North Carolina called RAIN, Regional Interfaith uh, Network, Regional AIDS Interfaith Network. And many years ago, they hired me to do their summer camp for their youth living with HIV. And then from that um, word of the work that I was doing with those youth, and these are kids who were born with HIV, um, got to an organization called Safe Haven, which is a international organization that does spring break and summer camps for kids living with HIV all over the world. Um, and so I was in charge of all the U.S. domestic camps, which were held in North Carolina and Maryland and in Martha's Vineyard. And I went on to be program director there. And then an agency in Charlotte heard about the work that I was doing with Safe Haven. And then I became one of the program directors at a federally funded organization called the Powerhouse Project, which uh, served at the time uh, mostly gay men and um, trans women. Um, so I dealt with, on a regular basis, people who were living with HIV, people like D-Man, uh, people like Arnie, you know, um, who were living with HIV. And um, unfortunately, those, unfortunately, those who also lost their lives to AIDS. And I wrote a piece called A Walk in My Shoes. Mm. Um, that was commissioned by Johnson C. Smith University, which is the historically black university here in Charlotte. Um, 
around the 2012, 2013, the CDC um, issued a study where they saw that there was a higher prevalence of HIV and STD and STI infections on historically black campuses. I'm, I'm sort of curious about, um, I'm just gonna pause here a second because one of the things I'm seeing that, that strikes me coming from uh, D-Man to um, Rodessa, your work, there's a process it seems like to be able to help people to take, and Bill T. Jones does it with his dancers too. It seems like part of part of creating work out of crisis, there's a kind of process you, you have to go through in, in, in a way. And I'm wondering, you know, did, did you have, you know, in, in with yourself, with the people you were working with, a process to bring them together to help them tell a painful story? You hear me? Who are you addressing? I, to you, Jermaine, the, this idea of process of like- Yeah, there, there how, certainly how was- How all these people to sort of, how, how do you bring them out to create it, turn it into a work of art? Yeah, the when we, when we were first commissioned to do A Walk in My Shoes, and I wrote that show based on my experiences as a program manager, you know, working with people who were living with HIV and, and, and STD infections. Um, we did it as a community theater project. So the cast was made up of what in the health industry we consider consumers. Mm -hmm. So these are people who are a part of our at-risk population. So a part of the cast were LGBTQ plus folk, um, Black female trans sex workers, mm -hmm. um, people who had substance abuse issues. And so um, early on in my training, um, I, um, I had a wonderful opportunity through the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts to get a mastery certification in a creative art therapy. So I really employed that in order to get what I needed from the actors so that they could give what they needed to to the audience. Um, and that included all kind of creative art therapy activities centered around uh, visual art, movement, um, theater art, and also written word. Um, and it helped get them to a place. Uh, many of them were, you know, for many of them, this was art imitating life um, because many of the characters that they were playing, you know, was a reflection of their very lives. You know, so as you can imagine, for many of them, it was difficult to be that naked and vulnerable um, in front of audiences of their peers and their own community. Um, but we did a lot of pre-work uh, through creative art therapy activities to get them there. And that's something that I also employ whenever I do, you know, like a Redessa, a lot of the work that I do is centered around art for social change uh, art for impact in our community, art for healing, art for education. Um, and so in order to do that, you got to get, as Roz did, you got to get your performers set. And you have to oftentimes take them to an uncomfortable place. Right. In, um, in fact, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut you off because there's a clip of Rodessa's work I want to play. Mm -hmm. um, uh, for this documentary th that is about your work. I think it's in process, but I, I want to play this clip, this particular clip, because you can kind of see the way uh, Rodessa works in this clip. So Julie, if we have that. I love the, the reality of us all gathering. I love that. I love watching women discover their bodies again. I love it when their babies come and the babies are scrambling about, uh, you know, you gotta be able to play. A lot of the women, their lives have been so hard that their girlhood was snatched from them so soon, either, you know, pregnancy or rape, incest, and then drug addiction and this kind of stuff, and to be able to be a part of, let's just play. Yeah. Rock, rock, rock. 
watch my hands. People, people forget about their hands. But you can do Damn. this. You can do this. Mm -hmm. oh, Tuesday, I'm gonna do that. It's almost 70, everybody. Returning to your younger self, discovering creativity. Well, all this stuff is very, very important to me. I am from Shoot 'em Up Bang Bang, where we slang <laughs> to maintain. I am from a block of ballers, shot callers, players, dead or alive. These are the things that we did to survive. Yeah. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. The roof! The roof! The roof is on! It's a theater process that's rooted in storytelling using improvisational techniques. Give me this. Right after your fingertips, right after your fingertips. If you're gonna, if you're gonna, if you're gonna give me a balance, use your, use your And we add writing and journal keeping, singing and moving. We talk about rape, we talk about shame, we talk about all these things that so many of us just kind of shove under the rug. And that's another reason why I think I stuck and I stayed because I felt really comfortable with Rodessa. She just, it, it was okay. I felt like it was okay. Like I can just let loose, you know, with her and not be ashamed of what I've done, you know, and what I was doing. That's just so powerful, uh, you know, and I'm sorry, that is a completed documentary. I, I uh, apologize uh, for, for um, uh, you know, uh, whoops, hang on a sec there, I a little yeah, it, it was, it was, a, it was a, uh, yeah, and the documentary is This Ain't Your Mother's Theater Company, so. Um, yes, uh, and it grew me. out of uh, working with Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood approached us, um, 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 what this is three or four, maybe five years ago, around the political tension in Washington, and also the assumption that black women, that uh, that uh, women on the edge, were not that invested, and women with HIV were not that invested with Planned Parenthood. And I did run into women who wanted nothing to do with it, black women because they felt like Planned Parenthood was just, uh, you know, uh, an abortion meal, but they came into, I said, no, you got to talk to the group about this. And finding out from my HIV women that Planned Parenthood had been the first place that they had gotten assistance, they had gotten food, they had been tested. Mm -hmm. And uh, the whole idea that uh, for, for Planned Parenthood and the, and the, the very uh, political scene itself to have these women step up and say, no, this is very important to us. We have a right to our bodies. We have a right to what what we can and cannot maintain at any, any one given moment. And to find like women feeling, feeling like they were, they were like actually, um, you know, uh, uh, they felt like they were being, uh, you know, uh, uh, held up. They, they were being supported and uh, inside of jail. Cause after the women you just saw, they had just gotten out of jail and it was just them talking about Planned Parenthood and being on the radio and having Planned Parenthood Come in and Planned Parenthood learned a lot uh, again about as uh, 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 Jermaine was saying. Planned Parenthood got to look at how big the scope of what their work was about, and I was surprised mm -hmm. even in, in the Bay Area where I live in San Francisco. But they, it was very full for people to realize that all women had some opinion about Planned Parenthood, oh, and, and uh, that was pretty amazing. You know, to find that that came out of my techniques where it just simply starts out. I, I say to women, you know, uh, what happened to you? When I go into a jail, I, they said, you know, the, pol the police, I said, no, what happened to you? Tell me about what happened to you. You know, Rodessa, you know, Rodessa, just quickly, it, I, what I wanted just, Laura, what I just wanted to uh, just observe is that all of these pieces of, of work are asserting that that art can be revolutionary and art Absolutely. is revolutionary, yes. both yes. for the individual and for the society. And, yeah. and they all assert it in different ways, but it's all, yes. that's what it is. If, if it approaches the real world. 
Yeah. And I, I was I, I actually um, because we're, we're running out of time, I could just continue to talk about these topics. But I think it's in all of the work here, what I'm seeing is both building a sense of of community around struggle together, turning it into a work of art where you can see that struggle turn into beauty. And and to to see uh universal pain you know maybe the particulars are different it's aids uh it's you know or um it's poverty or you know not being able to deal with a child but to see that come out and to create these beautiful things that uh somebody who hasn't had that experience can understand and can relate to and um i want to just end on one thing because we only have a few minutes that I want to ask you about. We are coming out of a pandemic. I mean, did you ever imagine in making this film about making art about a pandemic that it would come out in a moment when we're in a pandemic? And I'm wondering if each of you, if you could just take a minute to sort of say, how do you think going forward, this pandemic is likely to affect the work you are doing as we come out of it? How has it affected you in the last year and a half, uh, you know, in terms of what you're doing, um, uh, let's uh, let's let's start with Roz. Uh, yeah, sure. I think uh, the pandemic has changed everything, and I think that um, the pandemic, the uh, uh, George Floyd's murder within the pandemic, changed everything. You know, and so I feel like, yes, uh, when I, if, if we shot that scene that we started with now, <laughs> those, those kids are in an entirely different place, you know? So, so yes, it has changed everything. It has, it has, as Bill says, given us the shove that we need to, to get up. And and uh, and it starts with the personal. It's how is the, as Rodessa, that's so beautiful. Giving women back their bodies, giving every. It starts with the body, you know, and and um, and and then moves outward from there. And we're witnessing that. So yes, it's it's changed it's everything. You forget you have a body in the age of Zoom. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So, you know, I uh, Rodessa, uh, briefly, if you could just you know say a little something about where, where you are coming out of this pandemic? Well, uh, coming out of the pandemic, uh, I've asked the women, you know, because uh, I'm dealing with a population, they know Oprah, a lot of them, but other than that, that television, literature, and we have, uh, right now, we are reading the Trojan women. You know, mm -hmm. we're reading this, the, the myth of the Trojan women and putting them inside of it. But I've always said to women, uh, what are you gonna do with the new normal? And they said, what do you mean? I said, when this all lifts and we come back out, we stand looking at each other, it will be a different world. It already is a different world. No, I did a lot of people hide with the mask. A lot of people, they're so glad that they don't have to, to really talk <laughs> and socialize. They, they can hide and then a lot of people are dying to get out and talk about where they've been and what's happened. And, and I would just say that I always say to, women, you have a right to a life. And then with the pandemic, I say, let's ritualize this pandemic. What can we do to, uh, what can we do to find resilience? And because we're still alive, you know, we're still alive y'all. And it's like, what is it that we will be able to tell our children that we did to stay alive, to stay healthy, to stay conscious, to, to stay positive? And they say positive. I say, yeah, well, we're all alive. What is it that's inside of this that you're going to take forward and, and, and strengthen your position, your families, the culture? So mine is a lot about resilience in the pandemic with a population that- You must, you must get that from your brother because that is in so many ways what uh, D-Man is about, resilience. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm yeah. older than him, so he gets. You're it. older. That must be. That must be. It. Right. Let's get that straight. I, I, that actually. Is there anything you feel like with the populations that you're working with there in North Carolina that you know are going to come out of this pandemic in your work? Oh yeah, yeah. You know, I was chatting with my mentor the other day, and and he reminded me that God, the Creator, the universe—you know, however you identify it 
squeezes the good out of every situation, mm. even something like a pandemic. And so the, the, the thing that I got from that conversation is like, people are ready to get engaged now, right? And that's mm-hmm. exciting. So, you know, I, I would presume with Roz and, 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 and my sister that, you know, during the pandemic, I know for me, um, I was able to utilize social media and oftentimes a lot of the performances and works that I posted online, I had much larger audiences mm-hmm. than I ever did in person because everybody was on their devices. So yeah. what I've been um, you know, wrestling with now is all the wonderful, exciting things that we get to engage now that people are excited about being in front of somebody's face. People are excited about gathering again, right? And 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 uh, coalescing again. So I'm excited about all the wonderful works that all of us are going to be able to do and present to our communities, and how open they are to receive those things that maybe they have been in the past. Well, and Tom, you're I, I you're think that the, okay. I, I was just going to say to follow Jermaine's biblical course that that it's been like the the proverbial ref, the this epidemic has been the proverbial refiner's fire it 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 mm-hmm. it's it's put such in, intensity on us that the stuff that comes out has been stuff of real value mm-hmm. uh, and 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 it has shown us areas of truth that we have to keep keep a hold on now as the society surfaces uh, and I think that's coming out in art all over the place. Well, it does. It does indeed. Just to sort of finalize here, and thank you all for for your time. But it does show watching. You know, D Man now having gone through this other pandemic. I think that the dance the, it shows its value. What what it what makes it a timeless kind of work is the power. Uh, of going through crisis and having resilience through it and um, the power of art to help us through it. So um, thank you all uh, so much, Jermaine, Roz, Radessa, Tom. And um, yeah, everybody should go watch this film if you haven't seen it already. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura. Thank you.